Now, say my name. The Rolling Bad Podcast. You're goddamn right. Welcome to episode two of the Rolling Bad Podcast, recording the 27th of June in the desolate wastes of Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm your host, Elric Edge, and tonight joining me is... Bill Costello. And James Tapia. And together we are the Rolling Bad Podcast. Tonight's show, we're going to be covering some new information, and we've changed up how we're going to present it to you. We're going to have a little bit better segues into our show. We're going to try to normalize the audio a little bit better. Hey, we're learning this stuff, guys. We're going to kick off the show with our first segment, which is going to be... The Realm of the New Dawn. Which is our segment on what's new from GW and how they're going to take your money. Okay, so the first thing we want to cover is something that's already come out. It came out last week. It's the Lost Patrol set. It's actually for 40 k but the only reason I wanted to mention it here today is after opening it up and looking at it and remembering the old game, notice that the copyright dates on the sprues are from 2004 and 2005, so they're really dredging up the old stuff. So we also want to talk about the General's Handbook. Uh, it's not out yet, but a lot of the British guys have gotten advanced copies signed by Jervis Johnson, which is really cool. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. And Ben Curry did a, an AMA and asked me anything on the Grand Alliance forums, which you can check out at tga.community. He, there was a lot of questions. I, I think he was probably restricted heavily on what he could really answer, but the fact that he could even answer anything is really cool. I know he did a, a he did a show afterwards where he went into went in depth a little bit more about it. There's also um, he did a YouTube video as well in regards to it. But from what we've seen from leaked pictures and the information that we've gotten from from him as well, the narrative chunk of the book takes up what looks to be the largest portion, which is really cool. And on that narrative part, there's four different ways of playing the campaign. Yeah, there's the uh, League Way or Ladder version, I believe. There is a map-based campaign. There's the Path to Glory style. And then I believe there's a Renown way of kind of doing it. Okay. Yeah, building up a, le- you know, a hero from the ground up. I wonder if there's a way to maybe incorporate all of those into one thing in some form. Like a, a map-based bit also allows you to build up characters and i'll bet you you can mix and match yeah i I bet it's pretty fluid also we got a a, quite a good chunk of the match play as well pictures of points and how certain armies are going to interact with the style of army build they're implementing where you get battle line units and how some models take up multiple slots kind of a nod back to seventh edition in a way there where uh some models took up heroes and board mm-hmm. slots, which is kind of cool. Also, one thing I noticed is that some models explicitly state that you can only take one of them. So no multiple Nagashes, <laughs> <laughs> no multiple Archeons on the table. That kinda, would be bad. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The points looked about to be, I think he said they were basically South Coast points times 20. Mm-hmm. Pretty much to get you to your 2,000 points. Yeah. Roughly most of them look that way. Yeah. That uh, seems about right. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's really similar to the South Coast comp in that you buy it by the War Scroll, so you just buy you know five guys for 160 points, and then you buy another five guys to a max of I think it's like three. Or it says I think it says like 15 models to a unit or three War Scrolls to a unit, something like that. Hmm. It gives you a minimum size, a maximum size of everything. Yeah. So that, that's well, okay. I was gonna say because some of the How's that going to work with some of the units that get their bonuses at 20 models? But then again, those come in chunks of 10 usually. So Yeah, I think they start off with chunks of 10. Yeah, like maximum of so 40. if you have three, you get 30 of them, so you get the bonuses. Okay. And I didn't see anything. Actually, I think one of the biggest ones that applies to is like the free guild, the new empire stuff with, with the swordsmen. But I didn't see a leaked picture of, of anything about those guys. So I don't know. It also, from what I can tell, does not have rules for any of the silver tower stuff it yeah. doesn't have any of the forge world stuff hmm. um, but it did have all the points for all the quote-unquote legacy scrolls i mean yeah. tomb kings are in there 
Bretonians are in there. Oh, are they? Yep, they all have oh. points. Now, see, Ooh, that's so that's cool. smart, and that's Sounds awesome. Like... <laughs> There's also points for new units that we haven't even seen yet, including the Sylvaneth, which we'll touch on, as well as, was it New Beastmen or something? I, there was somebody talking about it on, well, I think one of the guys that got an advanced copy mm. was talking about there's there's new Sylvaneth and there's another faction that got a couple new unit names. Yeah, uh, but I don't know about like pictures or, or anything like that. I kind of so, hope they plus up the Beastmen a little bit because you know I've been listening and reading all the fluff, and the Beastmen are just a punching bag of everything that comes through the fluff. Yeah, they're <laughs> kind of that way in the uh, the end times. They're just <laughs> yeah, the fun uh, guy whenever they needed one. Yeah, they were always always those kind of guys. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Even in even in the uh, Beastman book, they didn't really seem to to win a whole lot, <laughs> and that's in your own book. That's kind yeah, of, it's <laughs> sad. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh well. But that's I mean that's really all we know so far. I think I don't know if there was really. You mentioned some of the different kind of scenarios that they're will have in match play based on objective. I know at one point some of them come down randomly on different turns. Um, on one of them. For each turn you on, for each turn it is, you score points equal to the game turn. Hmm. So the objectives get worth more and more. So there's a whole bunch of, I think he was saying there's six different ways to play. Wow. Or oh, wow. basically pitch battle scenarios. Okay. And I know there is also the rule of three. I don't know if we want to go to that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's uh, pretty interesting. I saw the rule of one. Or, yeah, three, three rules, three three rules, rules of, of one. one. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So Those, that's a good change right there. Uh, so to recap on them, the first rule, I believe, is that you can only cast one spell of any type, regardless of how many mages you have on the mm -hmm. table who even know that spell. So if you have three mages, obviously all, all of them know Mystic Shield, but you can only successfully cast it. Well, you can only cast it once. Really? Even if, even you, if fail? you fail? You even if you fail, you only cast it once. You only oh, cast okay. It once. okay. Fair so, enough. So that... That really restricts uh, spamming of spells and things like that. Well, I think it's really good for Stormcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll touch on that one. Yeah, a little bit. Um, and then the second one is any rolls of one fail. Automatically fail, yeah. yeah, yeah. any rolls of a one to wound, to hit, and armor saves. Yeah. We're always one. So it doesn't say anything about double ones for a charge, if that still gets you in, if you have a bonus to your charge rolls or anything like that, you still make it yeah, yeah. as long as you get within the half inch. Right. But it, it's those three specifically to hit, to wound, and armor saves uh, rolls of one regardless of your bonuses fail. And, and it does it, state that that's before modifiers, I believe, right? I thought it said before modifiers. So you can't modify your one into a... Yes, correct. Exactly. Okay. So it, it does give you a chance for the big... Oh my god, named characters to actually just die. Oh yeah, that's true. And then the final rule was the one unique named characters, I believe. Yeah, so you can only have one Archeon or one Nagash yeah. on the table. Oh, okay. One unique character. Okay, yeah. Oh no, no. It's any extra attack, hit rolls, or wound rolls that generate additional attacks, such as the Ripperdactyl's Voracious Appetite, can only generate one additional. Ah, okay. And that's where it stops. So it's yeah. not an infinite chain of infinite yeah. for the blood. I guess game. I won't be using my demon that's very often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn power gamer. So, yeah, that, that's obviously all for the match play. Uh, you can incorporate it however you want. Yeah, and they have... Changes at the summoning too. Oh yes, where the change the summoning comes straight out of the your original army list, so it's not like you get additional points to summon. Yeah, they they simplified it a lot. I mean, I like the way South Coast does it. Uh, we'll see how it works with uh, journals and handbook. I see tactical ways to use it. I, yeah, you, now that I've actually seen summoning used in games and how it. It can be pretty unreliable unless you really stack your army around doing yeah, it. Yeah, pretty much unless you're casting with Kairos or Lord of Change, you're kind of hard to get some of those bigger right, spells off. Right. And when it's coming out of your, you know, your two thousand points, we'll mm -hmm. say against an, an opponent's two thousand points, you, I mean, you're starting down, and if it's not, if you're not getting what you need right away, I, I don't know if it's or really, they 
put that you know paladins into your caster yeah, yeah right yeah, away right away like, yeah. you're down however points you were planning on summoning exactly exactly but you know you still you weigh that against the benefit of when you're summoning you put the unit where you want it so for the most part yeah and there there are some casters like nagash can get whatever he needs whenever he needs it, right wherever he needs it. i mean it He's he's pretty solid and reliable, and so is Archon. I think Archon gets yeah, overshadowed a lot yeah. by uh, by Nagash. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting. I want to see I want to see people use summoning with the with the new handbook and how that works. Do you think this form of play will go toward help towards winning uh, a lot of the people that left when Age of Sigmar dropped a lot of the tournament players? It seems pretty toned down, where it's not so crazy with the summoning, so crazy with the additional attacks, ones always fail. Do you think this will help bring a lot of those old tournament gamers back to AOS? I think so. Um, it gives a solid format to play with. Uh, it gives structure as far as the points and army builds go, but it's not it's it's not too constricting. I think you'll still be able to build some fun, wacky, fluffy lists, especially with your general character unlocking certain... I'm sorry, no, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't work that way. It's by battle tome. So, like, if you want to play Iron Jaws, as long as they all have the Iron Jaws keyword, I think it's all right. based on keywords, not uh, a hero character unlocking yeah. something. No, but heroes do get some artifacts, I think he said you could customize yeah. with, yeah. and some special command abilities. Those look pretty crazy. Yes. If what I've seen... I The stuff that I've seen for that isn't actual pictures from the book. It's more of somebody using a notepad and, yeah. and posting pictures. So that stuff sounds pretty cool, but I, I'm not going to put any stock in it until I have the physical copy in my hand. Yeah. But as far as using keywords, unlocking battle line units for, or for units that aren't normally battle line units, I think that's still going to allow people to, to build their themed, fun, fluffy lists. Exactly. Uh, so having that aspect as well as a structured point system and some some hard rules to to go by i think i think we might be able to get some of those players back i'm i'm hoping i'm really hoping that some of those people uh, will come back i think the guys that are in it for the competitive play will probably come back i don't think you'll still see the rank and flank guys come back because it's still a skirmish game well you can put I, I think you can put just as many models on the table oh, as yeah. you used to. It just doesn't have the rank and flank look, which right. I like the way it looks now. Yes, compared to the rank and flank, I had a lot of issues with with how seventh and eighth and all the previous editions worked. I it's had issues with movement, movement trays. I just yeah, uh, but I if that's your gig, mm -hmm. you know, and you like that style of play, then more power to you. And yeah. I can understand why yeah. you wouldn't want to. Oh yeah come back to the round bases than the fluid movement and stuff like that. It, it is definitely that Napoleonic style play definitely appeals to a certain yep. type of gamer. So, but hopefully this will go a long way towards bringing that community back. So speaking of match play games workshop just announced that they're going to be running the warlords tournament on the 10th and 11th of September at Warhammer world. So this is different from the skull of thrones. Throne of I'm skulls. sorry. Throne of skulls tournaments. They've been doing this is an actual points-based competitive match play utilizing the new match play system mm -hmm. out of the General's Handbook. I would imagine they'll still have quite a bit of like fun, fluffy stuff attached to it to an extent, but this actually looks like a legitimate tournament. I think so. Yeah, like I think they this used is, to run. Yeah, this is this could be GW's you know foot in the door back into organized play. And there's nothing stopping them from doing uh, a Warlords type thing like this one month and then a month or two later doing a throne of skulls fun yeah. fluffy a fluff everyone is. <laughs> yeah you know it it certainly seems like lately if you follow the games workshop feeds they've been doing stuff pretty much non-stop at warhammer world yeah which if you live in nottingham pretty sweet if you live anywhere else you just kind of it's a hell of a commute going. from albuquerque so. a little bit yeah <laughs> i think there might be a swim involved so, did you guys want to touch on anything about the Warlords event? Mm, do you want to take guesses on how many people? Do you think they're going to sell out? I'll bet you anything. 
they will. Do you know how many slides they're holding? I'm assuming it's pretty big. Yeah, I think they do about 100 people there. I was going to say, yeah, it's usually around 100 people, I think, is what they usually limit the room to. I got to so, say, if you got the opportunity to play a matched point game in Warhammer World on those tables, I think you take it. Oh, I, yeah. I would sign up for it oh, in a yeah. heartbeat if I, mm -hmm. if I'd be waiting I was up at there. midnight or whenever they decide to release those tickets. Yeah, yeah that's true. Sure would. So, good on them for, for setting that up. And uh, for coming back to the community, you know. Absolutely. We also got an update on the campaign, that the, the Seasons of War campaign that's coming up here. And, geez, I think it's only about two weeks away is this recording. Yep. So, by the time this hits, it'll be just around the corner. We got a little bit more information about how it's, again, set in the realm of life. We also got a map that just dropped today that has... Three cities that <laughs> apparently that are currently held by order, and everyone will be fighting over those. Yep. And based off the battle reports or whatever that the information that they get from the community will dictate how everything goes there. So they say the map is a, a fairly large expanse of of land. So it'll be interesting to see what that entails. I, I'm wondering if maybe they'll give us some special missions to try, maybe or or maybe some rules for siege. Yeah. You know, something like that. That could be interesting. That might make me build that hell fort just just for the fun of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I got a couple hell cannons and <laughs> wait. Yeah, really. We can crack skull that thing, Dad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if that's even a spell anymore for this game, and I don't remember. But I wonder if they're going to do something like, you know, release battle plans in... The White Dwarf, the weekly White Dwarfs. I know White Dwarf is going back to monthly, but they just might do something, you know, while they're still on that weekly schedule, that might be something they're going to hit. I don't know. They could, but uh, they definitely specified that in the new White Dwarfs, there will be new rules and missions mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So, yeah, that could, that could totally be our place that we find new uh, s substance for this campaign as well. I'm sure they'll have it all over the their oh yeah their facebook feed and also another quick thing on their facebook feed is i don't know if you guys have noticed they brought back the tale of four gamers kind yes of, oh, yeah. yes for for this campaign where uh, each each person is doing a different one of the four alliances and they that's kind of where they first hinted at uh battle line units from the general's mm -hmm. handbook and yeah and how the keywords uh affect your army builds etc and so that's going to be really interesting to watch and see the units that those guys add to their their armies and whatnot. Because the Tale of Four Gamers, I mean, you'll hear podcasters and everyone talk about how that that oh. was a a huge deal that got a lot of people interested. Mm -hmm. I remember when they were doing that. So it's very cool to see them come full circle back to that for yeah. Age of Sigmar. The round of So in the realm of whispers, we're going to talk about rumors as, as much as they can be rumors anymore. It seems that there's not a huge gap between leaked photos and, and release <laughs> dates anymore. But as everybody knows, unless you don't have any access to the internet, these new Sylvaneth pictures have dropped. And wow, wow. those are some phenomenal looking kits. I tell you, the, I'm going to cut to the chase. I think the new Alarial is an incredible model she looks massive on that huge beetle she is definitely here to collect some rent money mm -hmm. in the realm of life uh, <laughs> which is cool that that's where the the campaign is taking place because i think she's going to be a I big think, factor in it yeah i think she's going to be star the star of this new campaign and i don't think she's the emo queen no more yeah i <laughs> i think that seed has died yeah. and the new seed has <laughs> risen and uh yeah, it's, it's going to be bad news bears for, mm -hmm. for anybody in her way. We also have quite a few other kits um, that are coming out. The Spite Revenants. They look like some kind of a, a mix of, of a wood elf spirit and a dryad. I think maybe these are kind of like an additional core foot troop to dryads in the Silver. Yeah, they woods. could be tree spirits. Actually, it was kind of looked like to me. Coming oh, okay. out of the manifesting themselves out of the actual wood part. Okay, yeah. They look incredible. I I, I I like everything they put out for this. There's also the tree revenants. 
These look like tree men mm -hmm. updated to this century. Yeah. But like nightly versions, kind of? Yeah, they're kind of a mix of, they look kind of like a mix of wood elfy, dark elfy kind of human parts. You know what they, they remind me of are the, what is that dark Eldar unit that nobody uses, but they look absolutely phenomenal. They have no armor, but they have the giant glowing sword. Oh, but it looks like a dryad version of those guys. And and those are super cool looking. There's also oh, the Kurnoff Hunters. These are the tree men equivalents yeah. now. These yeah. are kind of the big monstrous infantry. They come with bows. They come with two-handed glaives and swords. The rules have also kind of leaked. The pictures of the rules of the White Dwarf have leaked. And these guys look tough. Man. Yeah. They, Range 30 bows. Yes. Uh, I think they hit on threes, wound on threes, doing D3 wounds. With yeah. One. That's, that's, I mean, that's going to be tremendous. I, they're going to be costly. Oh, I'm sure they are. They're going to be game changers, too. 30 so. inch range is pretty unique to have in yeah. a Sigma. That's huge. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're pretty much talking about artillery there, cannons, and, and characters. Characters that are the only few things that have that kind of range. Yeah, so to have a unit yeah. of something like that is pretty tasty. Mm hmm. And then we also have the the dryad. What is this one? This is I think she the might be Drycha. Drycha, yep. Yeah, the new Drycha inside inside of a dreadnought tree <laughs> body thing. This looks that looks so cool. I, the new models give this idea, this look, aesthetic of there's spirits <laughs> that possess. Mm -hmm inanimate trees kind of and then use those trees as weapons as opposed to like the old look kind of like the lord of the rings entish yeah where the trees themselves are just a living right. being that that moves and fights yeah. like i kind of like this it, it's their own personal spin on it but it's still very much that sylvan f what an old school wood elf feel yeah. too but yeah, the Dreicha in the in the huge tree body. I mean, if she's anything like the Dreicha before, she's she's not a pleasant individual. And to give her a giant tree body, yeah, could be very interesting. We also have the Sylvaneth Branch Wraith, which I'm assuming is a new character as well. This one, the picture actually comes with a price, which is going to be twenty three dollars US. That's that's it's pretty, pretty reasonable. reasonable. It, uh, yeah, it's better than some of the Stormcast characters. I think those are yeah, 28 bucks and up to 40 Even the Chaos, the Bloodbound guys are all around 30 yeah. bucks a piece, too. So, so yeah. this is pretty reasonable. And she's got a big branch glaive weapon thing. I, I wonder if she's also a spellcaster to some extent. Very cool looking model. This whole line is just... This stuff fits in really well with the tree tree man kit that came mm. out that has the dirt through and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. That's that it fits that aesthetic as opposed to I think at this point maybe the dryads don't quite fit in. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see that whole army laid out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think I think the tree man's kind of a halfway point between the old style because the old dryads are kind of demonic looking trees and the new tree man looked like he was kind of demonically possessed. As opposed to being uh, an actual... Yeah. The Dryads look like they have like a hint of Slanesh to them. Yeah. Like I almost think of Demonettes when I, <laughs> when I see a big unit of yeah. Dryads on the table. But yeah, the, I don't, I don't want to go over all the rules. The pictures that I've got, that I've seen of those are in French, so you really only see like the yeah. stat lines. That, yeah. That's what gives me the impression that Ilariel is... She has the Spear of Kuranos too, which is yes. really cool. I'm very interested to see how that ties into her story. That's yeah. another 30 inch range weapon. Yeah, it Good is. Lord. Brutal. Yeah. So, but I, I want to see the fluff behind that and to see if Orion has any hint, maybe. Hmm. Or if he really is just gone for good. I mean, he didn't seem like a spirit. He's The whole aspect of the Sylvaneth is kind of like a seasonal thing. So yeah. you kind of die only to be reborn again. So it'd be interesting to see if there is a hint of Orion. What do you think about the uh, paint jobs on the models? I like them. The spirit aspect coming out of the trees and everything. I've always, I've always liked the wood elf slash sylvanath dryad type thing. In that they paint them, you get like a, a fall aesthetic, or you know everything's like a variations of browns and reds, and then they can do like a winter aspect where mm -hmm. everything is dead and. And then the vibrant springs and stuff. That's that's so cool. And then here you have 
these like spirits leaping out of them as well or taking control of them. Yeah, and it's it, kind of like your pop of color. Yeah, it gives a nice stark contrast. I said just all the browns and mm-hmm. greens. When I think about it, you know, one of the other great as examples they have of spirits are like the the Army of the Dead for the Lord of the Rings range and, and even the spirit hosts and stuff for for death. But those are all have like a green, a very, very green look. And I, I don't know if that would have looked as good. These have a very bluish look to them. So I'm kind of actually curious as well to ha- see how these spirits tie in with death. Like are there these, could be a possible connection there. Yeah, are these like dead spirits of what elves that that Ilariel has kept around, and now she shepherds them into into trees to, mm. to use as warriors, kind of like Sigmar does. It'd be just another way to piss off Nagash. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> or it could be the awakening of the spirits, like of the actual of the of the forest of and the everything. Forest. Yeah, I think they're going to play up this rebirth thing a lot. Yeah, yeah. them them changing or something like that. That could be that could be something. Yeah, sure. Either way, it's a very exciting release. Uh, you can also look at, uh, there's a video that they did with Rob Symes from the Bravery One podcast where he glances at the new Sylvaneth book and then looks up and says, this is going to be amazing, uh, which I think is kind of funny <laughs> yeah. that, that they did that. Um, so there, there is also a book that's coming out, should be coming out. There's yes. no leaked pictures of it, though, which is kind of right. interesting, but... Uh, yeah, they're they're gonna get their own battle tome and everything, which should be pretty tasty. It's gonna be new and fun. Yeah, I, I pretty much know which army I'm gonna be doing after my I get bored of my stormcast. Luckily, I have about forty dryads and a tree man and some other stuff in the wood elf army. Uh, should be good. Yeah, I think I, I think I still have twenty twenty five sisters of the thorn slash wild riders. Oh, I never got, was able to use an eighth edition. So wow. Uh, as long as they don't. Pump out mortal wounds like Stormcast do, then, <laughs> uh, then maybe it'll be a game for a change. But that's the only thing they have. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Realm of Creation. We're going to talk about what we did in the hobby since we last recorded. Uh, Bill, what have you been up to? Well, I actually started this weekend on painting my Celestine Prime. Doing him in a different, he's going to be all green like the rest of my army. I think I'm going to go with the Verdant Knights. But um, I'm using the, the techniques and all the stuff, not from uh, Games Workshop, but from Chris Balau over at MiniWarGaming.com. He's a painter I really like. I, I like watching his videos. I like watching his weekend shows. He did a pretty interesting Celestine Prime. And so I've been trying to follow along with what he's doing. Not exactly but I think it's coming out all right so far. I've got some more blending work to do, but so far so good. Yeah, I'm happy pretty, with it. Looks pretty good. Uh, you put what are you using the airbrush to put down the base colors? Yeah. yeah, the initial blends and stuff I did with the airbrush on on the swirly base that comes up to meet him. That's all done with the airbrush, and his cloaks are all airbrushed. Everything else is going to be hand brushed. Elric, have you been doing anything in the hobby lately? Uh, yeah, I've been doing quite a bit actually. Uh, I've been. Paying you to paint my demons. <laughs> That's about it. Speaking of painting your demons, uh, I was able to get pretty much your Slobber Knocker GT list busted out in two weeks. Yeah, about that. I don't know if I want to play demons. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it may be I, I, I want to play, uh, I don't know, Empire. You can play whatever you want. It's not going to be painted, though. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I was going to say, if you said Stormcast, I'm leaving. Yeah, there you go. I want an easy win. Oh, oh, oh hurt me to the soul, because I can't win with him. If you're just a little hostility in Elric's voice, it's from a game we played earlier this week. So Yeah, we'll touch on that later. So what have you been up to? Uh, painted those uh, your army. I think I got 10 Flesh Hounds, 3 Skull Cannons, 15 Blood Letters, uh, 2... Bloodthirsters and some Bloodbound characters done. All painted up. I mean, they're not amazing or anything, but they're pretty good tournament quality or tournament standard, I guess. Yeah, I think they'll check most of the boxes. Yeah, it, it was pretty... way I got it done pretty quickly was I went with the traditional corn scheme as much as I dislike it, but... <laughs> was, What's wrong with the corn scheme? Just too much red. It just, yeah, it just hurts my eyes. 
was able just to spray it with a flat primer that I've got at Lowe's or Home Depot. Sprayed it red, pretty much just painted all the little gold bits, painted some bone on there, washed it all brown and called it good. Oh no, I did throw on some of the uh, rust effect. Oh yeah, it actually Ooh. came out pretty good. The oxidation paint, I, I don't remember what it's called. It's a technical paint, isn't it? Yeah, it's the second. I think it's the second time I've used it. I used it first on my Hell Cannon. Is that the Typhus Corrosion or the Res of Rust? No, it's the turquoise oh. one. Oh, the Nilic Oxide. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks, it looks good. It looks like bronze. Yeah, the, it when it, you put it on, it goes on a little, just a hair too thick. I found that if I just dip, put it on the model, and then just dip my paintbrush in there just a little bit, it gives it just enough where it starts flowing and doesn't pull up too crazy. On Maybe the model. I shouldn't say bronze, copper. Copper. Yeah, yeah. There you go. brass, something like that. Yeah. I know copper. Copper oxidizes. I don't know about the rest of them. So I got that done. I was able to pretty much start and finish my Beast Mage, Ooh. which I'm thinking about throwing in my list for Slava Knocker. I was able, I used a the Warrior Priest from the Silver Tower box set. Got I used that as the base. I wanted to use something. I didn't want to use one of the old Empire Mages for a Beast Mage. I wanted something that looked Stormcasty, but at the same time being a Beast Mage. Right. And I was looking at the model like, this would be perfect. So pretty much just cut off his hammer. I uh, found some bits I had from the Hurricane. Oh, yeah. the, mm. And I used that for his staff. And I was able to replace his head with, I believe it's a Marauder head from the old Chaos Warrior set. Oh, wow. I for didn't that, realize that. For that grizzly oh, beast yeah. look. The transient look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, he's, he's a good looking model. And he certainly fits the aesthetic with while also looking unique. You know, like a like a mage in a sword and cast army without sticking out like a sword thumb kind of thing. Yep. So I, I think it looks pretty good. And then I was also yesterday started four more of your favorite, uh, some more Dracothian guard. Uh, <laughs> Got some base coats on that. I'm starting to line highlight those, and I I, should, I have it's pretty close to determined, but I'm I wasn't happy with the other Drake Authorizers I had. I converted those all from Celestin on Dracoth. Oh, they from all the starter looked, kits. From the starter set, I think I had five or six of those. And they all looked pretty much identical. identical. Right. So I decided, yeah, I know it's four weeks out, but might as well jump in right now and just get it done. Sure Which, you don't want to take just an all Dracothian guard with a Star Drake list? and I, I have 13 of them. I, I probably could. I'm sure you could. <laughs> I'm sure you could. I think the list you have now is, is much better. I think that's pretty much it for hobby. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, James takes a cake. Well, of course. <laughs> I'm a fiend. <clears throat> That's going to be a given as we go. So. Realm of Battle. Where we talk about the battles we fought. So last Friday, James and I played a game we've kind of been hinting at. I brought my Slobberknocker list of corn demons with a couple of bloodbound characters and he brought his stormcast eternals uh <laughs> there's really not a whole lot to talk about this game i moved my pretty models forward and you shot them off with your eight foot tall dwarf gun line yeah pretty much with the couple of shots from the track off riders yeah so it was a uh, good measure it was a rough go of it the amount of firepower that a shooty Stormcast Eternal Army could put out is pretty devastating. And then when you throw on that, the Dracothian Guard are just so brutal because they're fast. They have great armor, high wounds. They all put out mortal wounds. They all put out mortal wounds. They can shoot. Every one of them shoots well. Mm -hmm. And they all fight well in combat. Even the, the crossbow one fights fine because he's still on top of a a Dracoth, mm -hmm. who can do D6 damage if uh, he rolls a 6 to wound, which yeah. comes up a lot when you're using face hammer dice. Imagine that. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, yeah, Scarbrand got ripped down pretty quick by just some Dracoths. Yeah, I think in turn three, call it turn three, but that turn three I brought down, I was actually pretty scared. You had a Bloodthirster and 
Scarbrand on my half of the board. Yeah. And you just kill the unit of Fulminators. I was getting scared. So I brought it down the Prime, and by the time the shooting phase was over, there was nothing left for him to charge. So. Yep. <laughs> 15, 15 Judicators takes care of uh, Greater Demons or Bloodletters yeah, or insert anything here. Really. Yeah, I think one of my Drakoth Riders did the Fulminator did, what, six mono wounds to your Bloodthirster? Yeah. With his breath attack, like something like that. It, it was it was over pretty quick. The highlights from my side, pretty much anything Scarbrand touches just evaporates, which yep. is nice. But just like anything in Age of Sigmar, if, if enough stuff focuses on him, it goes away pretty quick. So that's what happened is I lost the blood letters round one to the shooting, and then round two started losing the the greater demons, and then after that, all I really had left was a couple of bloodbound characters and some skull cannons in the back, and yeah, that was going to leave you so much. So that was that was pretty much game. <laughs> I I thought that maybe I had a, a better chance going into that because we had played a game about a month or so ago, and I was running my Iron Jaws against a very similar list that you had. It, it had a Star Drake in it, and I thought. You know, yeah, the Judicators are pretty rough, but I seem to do all right, even with a bunch of foot slogging Oryx. And I forgot that in that game we played the South Coast. Uh, the Realm of Fire. The Realm of Fire scenario where there's a bunch of infinitely high terrain that you can hide behind and scoot around and get close. And, yeah, I didn't have that in this. <laughs> it was pretty much uh, over the top and into the into the into the mess of it. So. So, yeah. what do you think of uh, scenario? One for the Slavonocker GE. I like it. In the, the scenario, you get a man of the old world that starts in the middle of the board, and at the beginning of your turn, you, you can move him 3d6 inches in any direction you want. Uh, the goal is to attack him and put wounds on him, and every wound that you do is a tournament point up to 10. Now, when you attack him, you ignore all the whole profile of your weapon other than the number of attacks. attacks yep. And you hit and wound him on fives. And that's it. I don't think there's any way to modify that nope. at all. So it, it makes it much more difficult than you would think to rack up those 10 points. And when you hit him, he randomly moves oh, 3d6 in, inches in another direction. So he could go deeper into your own lines. He could shoot right back over to your opponent. He could just go... In a total random direction, and, and you kind of have to dedicate guys to put wounds on him. And it, it worked out pretty well for me because I had the 10 man unit of uh, corn dogs that chased him down and rocked up 10 wounds because they got four attacks apiece. So even hitting on fives and wounding on fives, I, I did pretty well and, and got the 10 points off of him pretty quick. But that was pretty much the only 10 points I got in that whole game. <laughs> so. Uh, you I really did kill guy. a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of storm gas, unfortunately. Yeah, but I I like it. Uh, you kind of have to dedicate something to putting wounds on him, and you, and you want to do it right away because if you don't have a unit that pours pours out a number of attacks, it's really what you're looking for because the rest of it doesn't matter how well you hit or mm -hmm. you know, mortal wounds and all that stuff doesn't matter. It's it's about volume of attacks. Which means you have to dedicate something that could be potentially crucial to your battle plan to running that, that guy down and, and racking up those battle points. And, and I can tell you, if you ever want to win a GT or, or anything like that, it's all about getting those extra points from the scenario. Yeah, it's every not, every point matters from our experience. Yeah, it's not just about smashing your opponent off the table. Oh, that is an interesting point in these scenarios is that you do get points from smashing stuff and... I mean, I think a third of the points available are kill points, which is kind of an interesting and different take on AOS than what we've seen from the South Coast or the Clash comps. I know in Clash, I think it's just the minor objective. It's like worth one point for whoever kills the most. I know South Coast, it might not even be a... It I might just be a tiebreaker. I don't think it was even in there. Was it kill points? Not I don't that, yeah, Not that I know of. So this, it, this has got definitely have an aspect of uh, wanting to inflict some serious damage for your opponent and kind of going for that old school 20 nil feel, you know, mm -hmm. of you got to get his points off the table to get that additional 10 for that and then 10 for the scenario. And then the remaining 10 came from, from the objectives. Okay. Yeah. So 
I, I like it, and and we're hopefully going to be able to crank out some more of the scenarios, just kind of test them and play them and, and see what we glean from those before we head to Oklahoma City and hopefully win some shiny toys. So that's that's really the only game we played since the last time we recorded, unfortunately. So yeah, I think I think I played my son. I played him the same scenario. Actually, I did something different. So he did the same thing you did, where he set up some big units and attacked the old little man right off the bat. He scored some pretty decent points off of that, but it kind of left me with the ability to bring all my force against what wasn't attacking the old world man. Okay. And I was able to kind of take all his toys off my turn three as well. So would you suggest focusing on the old man first to rack up those 10 points and then try to fight the battle or I, take your opponent off and then with the remaining turns, try to get those points off of wounding him? I think it really depends on your army. Okay, because okay, luckily for me, I had those judicators that crutch yeah, again right, right. that could pour out all those shots no matter where he was on the board, pretty much with, with their five inch move and their twenty four inch range, and being yeah. able to bring him back. You can kind of kill their army, and it it really doesn't matter where he kind of really goes to on on the board too much. I found a, it wasn't enough dice to do that many points to him. I think I only wrapped yeah. up like four or five points. In the remaining turns I had, which, you know, right. it's okay, but... You certainly have to plan it, too, because you can have ranged units to try to, to pluck away some points at them, but, like, I have three skull cannons in my list, which are essentially useless uh, as far as scoring points, because I hit them on fives, I win them on fives, but I only get one point. Even though the cannon does D6 wounds, right. it still only counts as one because you ignore your profile. Yeah, exactly. So that's so, why it's really dependent on... The kind of build of the, the army. army. So I, I think I think in your case though, you had those dogs. They were kind of expendable. I'd say. I well, think they were the right choice for. In retrospect, I I wonder if maybe I would have been better off getting them across the board as fast as I can to draw some fire from the judicators or 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 put them into combat with the judicators. But the issue is, you know, with Age of Sigmar. Units that have missile weapons can still fire them normally anyways. So even if I get the, the dogs into you and I'm chewing away on some Judicators, the Judicators fight essentially like Liberators in close combat. But then when your shooting phase comes around, you still shoot off my Blood Letters and well, the Greater mm -hmm. Demons and stuff. So that, I don't That know. is a change from, if you, will, if you look at the scenario pack, you're only able to shoot what you're in combat with. Oh, really? Yeah. That didn't come up in our game because... Right. You, you oh, pretty that's, much killed everything that you were in combat with, but... I have a feeling the best thing I could do is maybe read the pack <laughs> before, <laughs> before we actually do this. That I think, might be good. Because that's yeah. kind of a big deal. I mean, not that I have a whole lot of shooting in my in my list, but uh, definitely something to watch for anybody I'm playing against. That's a big change. Yeah. Um, then maybe, yeah, that would have been a decent idea to... Maybe try to tie you down with the corn dogs. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that many attacks on they, they could bring down a unit of adjudicators a turn. I think. I mean, they're only a four up save, and you get the the weight of dice on your side. Yeah, yeah, and you're only two wounds with five guys. It's ten wounds and a four up. Yeah. Twenty, twenty wounds get through. You're off. Pretty much. Four yeah. attacks at a dog. I mean, we break out the math hammer. Yeah, I mean, statistically, if I get every attack from every dog on you, then, you know, they'll take off a unit turn, statistically. That always works out so well. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's always awesome to fun. Anyways, it was, it, was a good, it was a good learning experience. How do you feel about your list? Is that really what you focused on? For Slobber Doctor? Yeah, I've read through the scenario packs, or the scenarios, and pretty much looked at everything I need to accomplish those tasks. I'm trying to think a tool to accomplish that. I think I have pretty much the core of the army down, and it's just swapping a couple of characters here and there, deciding how I want to place it. I think it's like 12 points I have, like 10, 10 12 points I have to play with. Uh, I haven't really nailed down exactly yet, but... So have you decided on Vexilor or no Vexilor? Oh, definitely no Vexilor. Really? Wow. Yeah, I haven't... I haven't been using them, especially with the way the tournament pack works, with the cap on the unit sizes for, especially for the Dracos, they get pretty hit pretty hard. Yeah. So you only take a max of three. Mm -hmm. 
they're not kind of not worth teleporting in that small of a unit. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah, and, and plus with the points increase, it's just it's pretty high. Yeah. Yeah, I think my list is pretty much set. Seeing as how <laughs> that's what you're gonna paint, so <laughs> I'm just gonna have to. No, I, I think your list is pretty good. I think you got the tools to deal with most of it. I think you just need practice. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was your first game. I don't. That's actually my first game with demons in Age of Sigmar. I've been playing wow. Oryx and, oh, and yeah. little little bits of Empire when the, the game first dropped. So yeah, I mean that's that's a huge part of the game too is knowing your list and knowing your opponent what his his list can do. And so that kind of stuff will always help. I mean that's what sets a lot of the top players mm -hmm. apart from the from the rest is they know what their army does. They know what your army does. They can anticipate that. They can counter that. Yeah, so there goes the realm of battle. Moving on. And now, the realm of lore. For our first up lore segment, we're actually going to cover something that hasn't been really done all that much. We're going to cover the corn demon armies. And my part of this is going to be to cover the fluff because I'm a lousy gamer and a lousy painter. So I figured I would do the fluff part. First thing I want to start off with is just who is corn? Well, everybody knows the old saying, blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. Every soul killed in anger in the realms fuels corn. Corn is the god of incalculable rage and hatred. He has no temples, he has no priests, he has no scribes. All he has is battle and people that go out and slaughter and kill and bathe themselves in blood in his name. And that makes him happy. Corn's whole thing in the in the old uh, demonic dark tongue, his actually name name is Carneth. It translates out to the Lord of Rage, Lord of Blood. He sits upon a huge carved brass throne atop a mountain of skulls. At his side is this amazingly huge two-handed sword, a legendary blade capable of laying waste the substance of worlds with a single blow. The fell weapon is known by various names to different intelligent races, including Woebringer, Warmaker, and the End of All Things. It's even rumored that when he swings that sword, he can open up a rift in time and space and allow the demonic legions to spill forth wherever he wants them. Now, in order to become cool in your god's eyes, if you're a corn follower, you have to bathe yourself in blood, slaughter lots and lots of things, and basically have ambition to become the nastiest thing in the realms. Some of the creatures that do this are, of course, the demon princes, and elevated above all those things are the bloodthirsters. And of course, there's a few of these named bloodthirsters. Everybody's favorite one is Scarbrand. I, doesn't everybody love Scarbrand? Oh yeah, Scarbrand mm -hmm. loves you. He just wants to give you hugs. Exactly. <laughs> hugs for the hug throne. <laughs> <laughs> now, Scarbrand's tale is sort of sad in a way in that he was one of the greatest champions Korn ever had. He would lay waste to cities, worlds, you name it slew innumerable mortars, mortals in the name of the blood god and was spoken of only in hushed whispers by those remaining. But because he was so powerful and so ascendant in Korn's eyes, Zinch finally got a hold of him. And what Zinch did was whispered in his ear all the time about he, how he was greater than Korn. He was more violent than Korn and he could probably take him. Scarbrand made the absolute stupid mistake of testing that theory. So he actually swung on Korn with his great axe, which was a bad mistake because Korn just reached around, grabbed him, and crushed every ounce of personality, life, you name it, out of him until the only thing that was left was his incalculable rage. When he was done crushing everything out of him, he then threw him through the Immaterium where he flew for like eight days until he finally landed back in the realms and cut a canyon through the world and got his wings ripped off, which is why he looks the way he does with his wings all tattered up. And he's just nothing but an incalculable killing machine now. In the recent Sigmar fluff in the Balance of Power book, Scarbrand makes an appearance. Archeon's getting a little bit upset about how whenever Scarbrand gets loose, he lays waste to entire armies. So Korn's made a big brass chain to lock him up with, but he's given Archeon the ability to lock him up and release him. So Archeon decides to use him, the slanner there, and they decide that this is really bad. 
Scarbrand goes and kills the whole Slan army. The Slan send him back. I'm not going to cover the entire fluff, but he does his thing, and he gets sent back to his prison, but he's not bound when he gets to the prison. And there's this whole scene where the Sigmarines are trying to steal the brass chain so that he can never be fettered again, and they don't quite make it. Anyway, moving on to the rest. During the end times, the Bloodthirsters were actually split into three different, kind of like the Vermin Lords. They were split into three different aspects, if you will. There's a uh, a Bloodthirster of Insensate Rage, a Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury, and the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster. Now, I'm not going to cover what these guys do model-wise, table-wise, other than each one of them on the table gives you a different sort of idea. The Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury is the ranged Bloodthirster. He does a little bit more at a distance. The Bloodthirster of Insensate Rage is the guy who does your up-close-and-personal hack-and-slash. And then the Wrathcorn Bloodthirster is just kind of a mix of both with some special awesome sauce thrown on. That's kind of the fluff for corn. I know I've left a lot out. There's a lot of other demonic units. There's the Skull Masters. There's the Flesh Hounds. There's Blood Thrones, Skull Cannons. Everyone's favorite Blood Letters. Heralds of corn that can be marked up. So there's a lot of really great things. And corn is quite literally, if you're going to play that army, you're not going to play with any magic because corn doesn't do the magic thing. He does the get in your face and beat you down thing. So, anything else you guys want to put in the fluff for corn? I think it's interesting that he finally got slaughter priests. Yeah. So while they're not wizards of, of any type, that it is cool that they kind of got um, a priest type. Well, and their really interesting thing is if you if, as you go through the fluff with them, they're not actually priesting things. They're not, you know, invoking spells or incantations. They're actually using the power of the blood they've taken right. to encant things, which is, it keeps with the corn fluff, but it does give you access to some fun things. And it's not to say that corn doesn't use magic at all, per se. He, he'll he use magic items. He'll craft oh, yeah. magic items, binding his rage, etc. Well, and he binds demons into swords all the time. Right. So he's, they're kind of the... Uh, Duarden of the demons. Or they, they don't have wizards, but they'll still craft incredibly yes. powerful magical items. One thing, I, I don't know if they touched on it on an Age of Sigmar or not, but it used to, you, had, you used to have the the four chaos gods. Two would be diametrically opposed mm -hmm. to each other. So it used to be Corn and, and Zinch. Zinch. Corn and, well, Corn and Slanesh. Oh, Corn, yeah, I'm sorry. Corn and Slanesh. Corn and Slanesh and Zinch and Nurgle both. Mm -hmm long time ago, it did used to be Corn and Zinch and Nurgle and Slanash that yeah. were di diametrically opposed. And then they changed that coming into 7th edition, I believe. I was oh. playing 40k at the time, so I think it was Yeah, I've only ever done but... the fluff, so I don't know really where the additions were. I think it might have been the change into 5th edition yeah. or something. But I remember it's back when I used back. to play 3rd edition 40k that it the, that was the one that always made sense to me was corn and zinc mm -hmm. hated each other. Yeah, yeah, because one was planning and the other one was just killing. Right, mm -hmm. and no matter how much zinc tried to put things together, corn would just smash it apart, beat the face out of it. But, so, though I guess the way they have it set up now, it still kind of makes sense. You know, zinc tries to create these machinations, and Nurgle just rots it all away, mm -hmm. and Slanesh is trying to create this perfect form of. Whatever it is exactly that he's trying to perfect, and corn just destroys yeah. everything just in his past. So kills it all. It still makes sense as well. I, I don't know if that's carried over so much well, into Age of Sigmar. I think a lot of the thing with Sigmar and corn is corn has been ascendant for so long because the realms have been laid waste, and there's nothing but a constant flow of blood. That you know, in the beginning, the first few books, they talk about you know the War of Chaos, where corn basically tried to kill the other three or two at this point. He's He really has been ascendant for so long because of the bloodbath. And now that that's sort of, I mean, even though the Sigmarines are coming and there is still a lot of blood, there's actually a lot of parody between the Chaos Gods. I think that's something they really wanted to hit in this edition, was he was ascendant for so long that it's time for him to take a hit. Sure. Well, and he's also the one that becomes ascendant the most frequently, oh, just yeah. because of 
he gets his power from carnage and there's always people fighting and he never cares where the blood flows as long as the blood flows so that's true so that was the fluff section moving on we're going to cover some of the models within the range the corn demon range so Alex, speaking of uh corn demons since you have a corn demon army you're taking to the tournament what are your some, some of your favorite models in that range? I like the the new blood letter. Well, I, I don't know if they're really considered that new. They've been around for quite a while. But the plastic new blood letters have grown on me. I have a, a lot of the older metal yes. ones. Yes. The, the bulkier <laughs> guys with the huge axes. I do have to say that I, I'm kind of sad they got away from the axe feel and went yeah. with, the, with the hell glaives. Uh, or hell blades, but they've they've grown on me, and I, I do have to say one of the great things about Age of Sigmar being on round bases is it makes blood letters so much easier to use because ranking those things up was an absolute nightmare before. Yeah, exactly. I remember having to put numbers on the bottom of the exactly. models. Exactly. This is one. This is two. This is three. And if they didn't go yep. together exactly perfectly, there was no way they're going to find. Them and even then, sometimes you'd put them back the way you thought they were supposed to go, and it's like, why is this not? working i measured all this before and it's not working this time yeah it's incredibly frustrating and i know when the the bloodthirster kit dropped it had some controversy i love it i think it's so dynamic and it's so angry i'm a huge fan of the double handed axe but uh the other ones look pretty phenomenal too i i think it pays a little homage to the balrog which i think is kind of where this mm -hmm. model yeah the idea of a bloodthirster started from the whole baylor from D, &D mm -hmm. as well you know it, it all kind of there's like this culmination into this new gargantuan bloodthirster model which just looks so good i think and yeah i also like the scarbrand kit quite a bit uh it, it gives a very unique bloodthirster for the special character my only problem kind of with, with Scarbrand is I notice like when I put my army down, I have Scarbrand and then I have a Bloodthirster next to him. And because the regular Bloodthirster has this real dynamic pose mm -hmm. landing on flame and he's got his arms outstretched and everything, it kind of overshadows Scarbrand. Yeah, I noticed that when I was painting them and he's grounded a lot more. But Yeah. And he's kind of got that pose where his feet are together. It kind of looks a little... I don't know, weird. The Scarbrand model? Yeah, is it Scarbrand or is it the other one I'm thinking of? I think it's the regular Bloodthirster that's kind of pirouetting down onto flames. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's the one I thought was yeah. kind of weird. Scarbrand yeah. has got like the linebacker pose right. of, of I'm sorry, me, my bad. Yep. Now, that being said, when I put two Bloodthirsters down on the table, if somebody wants to focus on the regular Bloodthirster because he's kind of an eye-catching model, and let's maybe Scarbrand get a little <laughs> closer. I'm okay with that. I, a little bit of psychological warfare mm -hmm. there. Yeah, uh, you know, you've seen one bloodthirsty, you've seen them all. Right. <laughs> the Skull Cannon slash Blood Throne model in Age of Sigmar, I think, looks right. Yeah, it didn't it didn't fit in fantasy before. I know when I was playing my Warriors slash Demons towards the end of the eighth edition there, when I did my Skull Cannons, I converted them with some Tyranid bits. Because I really wasn't happy with the can the mechanical. the mechanical thing on top. It looked it was too forty k. It was too yeah. space yeah. spacey for you me. I wanted to give it more of an organic. I wanted to give it exactly more of organic, more of the engine actually being a demon right. itself. Whereas I think in Age of Sigmar, things like the Skull Cannon or the Skull Grinder, uh, they I think they fit right in. Yes, for exactly. sure. So. Uh, so I, I really like that kid as well, and as, as same thing with the Juggernauts too. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I know that's an old model. The Juggernaut yeah. kit's been around for a long time, but it's also kind of had that issue of like, here's this big mechanical beast in a world where, I mean, I know there's steam tanks and and you know the old school dwarves had gyrocopters, yeah. etc. But those look like clunky prototype ish type machines. That, yeah. That you know, kind of like a World War One style feel, where the the life of a tank is measured in you know, seconds, uh, feet. You know how, yeah. like, how many feet can I get this thing across <laughs> the battlefield until it finally blows up? And then the Juggernaut had this like, it was a big, bulky, intimidating thing, but it was also kind of like sleek yeah. as well. 
but ultimately mechanical. Yeah. So it still kind of stood out. I mean, it looked good with with the Chaos Warriors on top because you know they're they're, they're big bros as well. So that that kind of flowed a little better. But now, I, to me, in Age of Sigmar, where just about anything goes, it they I think it all just meshes really well. I mm-hmm. like the way my army looks on the yeah. table and, and what have you. Um, that's really. And, the, and then the corn dogs, which look a little dated. Yeah, those yeah. Are, those are pretty dated. I got a quick question for both of you, and that's if all these new releases that we've seen out come out. Has there been a war machine that came out that has come out since Age of Sigmar dropped, or are we still looking at all the old war machines? I haven't seen one come out. No, I think we're still looking at all the old war machines. Yeah, I wonder if they're defocusing that stuff, trying to get away from it. Well, have they really touched on an army that would use them? I mean, we've gotten Stormcast, Bloodbound, Bloodbound. a weird Seraphon. The Seraphon. Skaven have come out. And, I mean, in the Start Collecting box, there's a, uh, you know, you can build either the Warp Claw or the Screaming Bell or what have you, but that's the only one that I know of. Oh, in the the Corn Demon, you get a Skull Cannon. Yeah, okay. But, you know, you can also just use that for 40K as well. It's Mm -hmm. the thing about demons is... Yeah, they work. Go back and forth between the two systems, but I just wonder if they're defocusing or if they're going to try to get away from War Machines, War Engines. I think the Sylvaneth release is a great example of how they're taking an older army and totally changing it to yeah. an Age of Sigmar feel. Yeah. So maybe with a lot of these older armies, like I mean, I know they came out with the Clan Pestilence Skaven thing. Some of the other stuff, like Free Guild or Duarden, mm-hmm. uh, that utilize a lot of war machines, they might just be waiting until they redo that line yeah. uh, and give it, you know, that AOS yeah, influx. the treatment, right? Yeah. So maybe that's that's what they're going. I don't know. That there. just question hit me when you were mentioning all those things, and I'm like, you know, I don't remember one coming out, a new one. For no, anything. no, I don't think there has been one. So, so hmm. I think that's. And that's pretty much the line of models. What what do you for the uh, back to the corn dogs? What do you think of the new corn dog on the cat on the corn lord that comes in the box? Corn dogs cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's <laughs> I think it looks really good. It, um, I think it suffers from the same issue the Griff Hound has, where like why can't we get more of that? You know, yeah. Yeah. that I kills know, me. I know there's people out there that use pl- uh, proxies. When it comes to flesh hounds, since the models are so old and dated, I know for my 40k army, I'm using Warrior, the old Warrior Chaos hound. Warhounds. Chaos Warhounds. I've yeah, modified a, those a little bit. It's a pretty common thing. Or I know the uh, the Puppets War miniatures are actually pretty. Oh, I don't know if I've seen those or not. I'll, I'll have to show you those sometime, but okay. those actually look pretty Cornish and pretty good. Yeah, and the price is a little hefty on them, too, because they're all mm-hmm. metal. Oh, yeah. They're one of the metal things that didn't get cycled out, uh, yeah, interestingly it, enough, mm-hmm. with the Crane Alliance Chaos book. Yeah, and there's also uh, the Herald of Corn and, and Skulltaker. Touch yeah. on those as well. Skulltaker has always been a, a very cool-looking model ever since they did him. And, you know, the Herald of Corn just looks like a big, tough... Bloodthirster. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, blood letter. Blood letter. Blood, 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 <laughs> etc. Hmm, there's a theme here. Skulls yeah, and blood. Right. So, you know, obviously you can you can branch. This is just the demons of corn, but a mm-hmm. lot of this stuff, like in my list, I use the two. The blood secretor and the, the blood, blood stoker. stoker. Yeah, yeah, the blood bound characters because they just work with corn. They don't mm-hmm. say demon. They don't say mortal. You can kind of intermingle some of this stuff with like bloodbound units as well, or I think maybe there are some uh, beast men type models that you can mark. I think there's a formation that I know is all minotaurs and whatnot, and it, it all has the mark of corn. I think it's in the God Beast book or something mm. like that. You might be able to mix in some some whippy bros, as you call them, the blood stokers, and throw them in something like that. I'm not sure. I haven't read the formation. But, uh, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of possibilities for a mono-themed corn list. Oh, and also just with uh, Slaves to Darkness, mm-hmm. just the vanilla 
old school warriors. You can throw marks all over them. You can, you know, take three wound chaos knights yeah. and, and give a mark of corn and they'll benefit from getting plus three inches to their march and, and run moves as well, which is pretty tasty. Throw in a couple of Varengard or three Varengard. <laughs> yep. Now Working you, on at the top and they, you they, have your, yeah. ca your cavalry. So. <laughs> For sure. Well, if you have Arkean at the top, that's like press an instant win. So, <laughs> <laughs> except for me. So, did you want to touch on uh, any tactics or anything like that? I wanted to actually want to talk on some of the painting. Yeah. Oh, I okay. think I think these guys, like I said earlier in our segment, was they're actually pretty easy to paint and do a reasonably well job pretty quickly. I think they're up there with the Stormcast. I mean, Stormcast, you do the same thing. You spray paint them gold, paint the little blue bits, wash it, and you call it kind of good. As the guys from Heel and Amber would say, just dip it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I, I found painting them was relatively quick, and I think I got pretty good results. I like them. I'm, yeah. pretty, I'm pretty happy with putting those on the table. I mean, you can do alternate things. You can do... You know, blacks or yeah, like even that. like some. I've seen some white corn stuff that looks pretty good. Oh wow! Yeah, I think I saw some some of the skull blood crushers or skull skull takers. The warriors one. I saw some someone painted oh, them white and had some splattering of blood on their armor. But hmm. I've some, I've seen some people do some interesting things with like blood letters. They paint them like pink. Well, not, and I know uh, Jason, one of the guys that used to be in our group, he did a, the theme of his whole demon list was Zinch. So hmm. everything was heavily converted, even though they were demons from other gods. So his blood letters had croup bits all over. I think they were straight up croup, but modified to have glaives and, or, or the swords and, and have a very corn feel, but they were painted pink and purple and blue and, and stuff like that. And he did the same thing for uh, for some skull th uh, skull cannons, but they were they were her cannons, I think, or luminarchs. Yeah, luminarchs that had tentacles and stuff oh, like nice. that with uh, some crew blood letters <laughs> hanging off. It was a gorgeous looking army, uh, and and it was all tied together with the with the Zinch theme. But it, you know, it had corn stuff. It had corn dogs as well, mm -hmm. uh, but those were modified. And, so it, it was really cool, and you know, it wasn't painted in your typical red and black brass, copper brass look as well. Yeah, one thing that came out in the both the, the original book and the Ever Chosen book is there's entire sections in there about painting them in different ways, but binding them together to show how they're part of the same army. But there's a lot of Ever Chosen armies that don't even look. Obviously, you're going to have all four different gods in there, but... They all have a different look, but they're tied together by, you know, a single theme. And you can do the same thing with demons. You could actually, they don't have to be red. No, exactly. I mean, you, I know for my demons, I've kind of done that. I have a mix of Zinch, Nurgle, Slanesh, and I, you can kind of paint them using the same colors, but put an emphasis on a certain color for each god. Mm. You know, like my Zinch stuff is blue, yeah. but it has some greens. And some purples in there for mm -hmm. Slanesh and Nurgle. And, but, you know, he, the Zine stuff is mostly blue with hints of that. The Nurgle stuff is mostly green, but has the purple for all the rotting flesh yeah. to tie it in with the other stuff. So there's things you can do to mix it all together pretty well. Yeah. And one of the big things I, I would stress is basing. Mm. Yes. You base all your demons to, yeah. you know, the same style. That is going to be the biggest thing that will tie it all together. So, like, for people that – I've seen people – talking about wanting to do different chambers of Stormcast Eternals in the same army, but is it going to look good? It, you know, it, it, look at pictures of, of old Space Marine units, yeah. you know, where you have like a, a unit of Black Templars in with a detachment of Imperial Fist. Mm -hmm. Those are very contrasting colors, but if you base it all the same, it, it, it can tie, it tie in pretty well. So, uh, you know, when you have something like demons, it can all just look so different color-wise. If you if you base it all the same, it'll really help tie that all together yeah. as well. So, what about playing a corn army? What 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 are some of the what's some of the cool things about playing a corn demon army? I would like to think that it it's pretty straightforward. You know, you just kind of run across the table and chop your opponent up and stuff. But it turns out it doesn't quite work. 
<laughs> as straightforward as you know, there's actually <laughs> tactics and strategy you got to employ and everything like that. But I like it. It's a challenge. It's kind of a rewarding challenge because you don't, you have the skull cannons for sure to give you some ranged presence, but they're not what they used to be. No. You know, in, in like an eighth edition. I'm not saying they're bad by any means. They they still pack a punch, but oh, yeah. they're not, they're not the terrifying unit they used to be. Yeah. Not, not 10 inches from the back. Right, right. And you also have no wizards. You know, if you're playing an all-corn themed list, you don't have any wizards either. So no mystic shields or anything mm-hmm. like that to to give you a bonus. Now the characters, there's there's some good synergy for sure in the corn list, and it, and that's where it comes back to that whole tactics thing. Is is you kind of have to think about well, my pieces have to be in specific places in order for this all to work, and if they're not where they need to be then this just isn't going to work and I'm going to get picked apart, you know, and it can happen quickly. You know, I, I have my blood stoker in that list to beef up the blood letters, but he's a little bit slower than the blood letters are, especially when the blood secretor, whippy boy, yeah, is, whippy giving boy. Him, <laughs> is giving him an additional three inches to run. It's really yeah. easy to outdistance your characters and you have to anticipate that, but you don't want to put your characters up front to kind of get a lead because, you know, they might be in range of 15 judicators or something like that. Well, wouldn't that be bad? <laughs> popped off the board. So you, you got to be really careful about, you know, placement and, and everything. And that goes for any army. There's no click and, and play kind of army out there, I, I don't think, anyways. I mean, I know there's like three Stonehorn, three Thunder Tusk lists, but I, I would imagine you got to pay attention to what you've got. Six models. Yeah. And if you make a mistake and start losing it, it, it hurts. So I don't think there's any like autopilot. I haven't style. seen an instant win meta army yet. So, for sure. You for know, sure. and we're a year into it. So, yeah. So I, I would say that it, and it just looks cool, man. Corn. Yeah. All that that wave of red and the big angry demons and I know a lot of people like Nurgle. You got the big oh, yeah. bloated dudes out there, and I got a bunch of Nurgle myself and stuff. But I, for some for some reason, man, the corn just it just speaks to me. You know. <laughs> yeah, so. I think after my lizard men, the corn bloodbound's going to be next. Yeah, I I can't wait. I I really want to do a team up game of my corn demons with uh, a corn bloodbound against yeah. you know stormcast or yeah. whatever is going to take us off with that <laughs> challenge. <laughs> wow, there is bitterness in this podcast. <laughs> really D6 wounds for rolling a 6? Come on, that's anyways. Well, you are demons and that is sort of what they're after. So uh, brutal. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, that, I think that's that's what kind of what like compels me to to put them on the table. Sweet. And James can paint them really quick. That helps. <laughs> well, that helps. That helps a lot. So that's going to pretty much cover the meaty part of the podcast where we covered the corn demon armies. So now we would like to move on to the realm of conquest. So in the realm of conquest this week, we want to announce something that we have coming up locally you want to tell us what we got planned yeah i want to announce the rolling bad rumble there's a tournament that i'll be running here in albuquerque at the active imagination location the store that we play at on august 6th that's a saturday it's going to be a three-round tournament we are going to use the rules out of the general's handbook because it, it will certainly most certainly be out by then at which will give everyone a chance to build armies accordingly as far as points and and everything like that i want to wait to give the specifics until we have the book in hand i know it's kind of a a south coast times 20 feel to Mm -hmm. it but uh, you know i don't don't there may be some gotchas in there yeah exactly and and there is there's actual structure as far as like well can i take can i take five giants kind Mm -hmm. of thing is that still a viable uh, list and so I, I don't want to give the specifics or anything like that quite yet but if you're going to be in town or anywhere nearby august 6th here in albuquerque we will be running a three-day tournament using the general's handbook a three game tournament a, th- a three game because yeah three tournament. days no is we're be... going all out <laughs> okay man. we're going it's big three days 
16 games. We're going to be taking 20 minute naps in between. I, you know, it's yeah. Okay, Adepticon, we're coming from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Start from the top, not from the bottom. There you go. Yeah, three game <laughs> tournament on a Saturday, one day or here in Albuquerque. So, and how many spots are we going to have for that? Uh, I would like to get over twenty if we could. Maybe cap it around twenty four. So, if if we could get that many, that would be phenomenal. So, uh, and listen up for our our contact info if you got any questions regarding the tournament itself or or Albuquerque or anything like that. So And we'll be putting everything up on the Facebook page and the website and everything else Absolutely. as we get it. So I think that's gonna wrap us up for this fortnight, unless I'm mistaken. That sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Okay, so as always, you can get a hold of us. Our Twitter is at rolling underscore bad. We each have our own Twitter accounts. Elric? Mine is at Elric Edge. E-L-R-I-C Edge. All one word. And I'm at Tersoth. And I'm at Bill Castello. C-A-S-T-E-L-L-O. We have a Facebook page and website, which is rollingbad.com. Hit us up uh, if you got any questions about the upcoming, upcoming tournament or the podcast or you know what our favorite colors are i don't know yeah any anything like that you have, so and if you have a couple of minutes leave us a review on itunes we'd really appreciate it and tell Absolutely. us how good or bad we are yeah so. uh, keep the feedback coming yeah uh, we got a lot of a lot of positive feedback from everybody uh hopefully our volumes are all <laughs> yeah. even now and everybody sounds you know good i think that was really the only uh critique that we had other than my other than my wife tearing me apart, but hey, you know, I'm used to it. Yeah. Hopefully I won't put it out with the volumes so low this time that you have to crank your radios up all the way. So that my my laugh can destroy your sound system. Resound through your speakers. Yeah. Yeah. All right, folks, that's it. Thanks. You wrote it down and I didn't see what you wrote. <laughs> You can't read my writing anyway. Oh, yeah. I think it was something to the effect of desolate wastes. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an interesting intro. Uh, I'm your host, Elric, uh, with with host, my two with my two sub hosts, <laughs> temporary hosts. <laughs> There's a Craigslist uh, posting, <laughs> so please answer. Host. Okay, I think you want me to do some kind of like voice for it. If you want, yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> and now, the realm of lore. I don't know why I'm covering my mouth. We can edit. <laughs> 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 wow, that sounded. <laughs> I, I want to leave that in for bloopers. Yeah, but I can't. that's gonna be on the. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not quite so fancy. <clears throat> <sighs> okay, anytime you're ready.